preparing this message for quite a long time. We were finishing up chapter 11 of Acts 12, of Acts, and then we were going to go on into Acts 12. Um, but as we were in the midst of worship this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit sort of change the change what we need to cover this morning. So what I'm actually going to do is skip the first half of of the of the message, and we're going to we're going to pick up halfway through. We're going to jump right into chapter 12. However, I feel the last part of chapter 11 is really important. We're going to come back to that. In the last part of chapter 11, we're going to we were we're going to take a little more time to talk about how gifts grow the church. And if you look at your handouts, you will see that it is in your handouts um, how the gifts grow the church. Uh, you can look on the la on the back side of that. You can also look on the front if you want to. Um, there are gifts of encouragement in the church of Antioch. There are gifts of teaching uh, in the church at Antioch. There are gifts of prophecy and, and prophets as well. So some of these are gifts, and some of these gifts come in the form of people who come to the church. And you say, well, that sounds a little bit strange. It may sound strange, but it's very biblical. Acts, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about some of the gifts. When Jesus went on high, he gave gifts to men he, and women. He gave gifts to us, and those were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So that's part of the Bible. And then there are gifts that he puts, that he gives each one of us as as his children, as part of his church, that grow the church. And so we see that in the Antioch church. The Antioch church is vibrant and healthy and growing, and it becomes mature very, very quickly. Have you noticed that? Have you, if you've been reading, sometimes, you know, we become Christians, and it just seems like we're babies forever, doesn't it? It is not God's plan for us to be spiritual babies for a long, long time. God gives us everything we need to grow up in Him and become mature. So when we come back to that, we're going to talk about it next time. But I feel like the Lord sort of shifted my focus, and we're going to jump right in to Acts chapter 12 this morning, to that really dramatic and gory and exciting story of James being beheaded, of Peter being imprisoned and miraculously released, and of Herod dying by worms. And you say, by worms? Yes, by worms. That's what the Bible says. And you say, I have never heard that before. You've got to read the book of Acts, okay? So I want us to, um, we're going to start from there this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you may turn to Acts chapter 12 if you want to. And if you want to follow along in the notes, uh, you'll see a little bit of it. On the first page, um, we talk under the people, we talk about Herod Agrippa. Under the first, James will be killed. And there are, uh, there are other things there are other things there as well. And if you want to turn to the back page, about halfway through the back page uh, starts this part of the message. So you can follow along if you will, or we can just look at this. So give me just a minute, and I'm going to get us to where we're going to start this morning. Here we go. Okay, Acts chapter 12, fighting against God. When I was preparing, uh, I, my initial thought was to skip over chapter 12, not skip, but go through it very, very quickly. Because it doesn't seem so instructive, does it? It doesn't seem so inspiring. What, what is there for us? And in fact, as I was doing my own studies, and um, I looked at other, uh, at other uh, commentaries, and I even listened to other messages at times and things like that, just to have a well-rounded preparation, it s did not surprise me uh, that in fact, there are some that were doing a series of acts, they didn't even mention chapter 12. They just went from chapter 11 to chapter 13. Um, a little bit odd, but as I was praying about it and thinking about it, I thought, well, I'll make a few summary comments, and then we'll just keep on going to the exciting part. You know, God's growing the church, and then Acts 13, in the, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and this and that's the beginning of the missionary journeys. But as I was praying and as I was preparing, I feel that... Um, the Lord, the Holy Spirit gave some further insights in this, in this section. 
we wonder why Acts 12 is where it is. I don't know if you have wondered that or not. I have wondered because Acts 11 talks about it's the church and the church is growing. And then Acts 13 and, and Acts 11 uh, talks about the Antioch is there. And then Acts 13 um, goes back to Antioch and there's this wonderful thing. And here in the middle is Acts 12. And in Acts 12, we go back to the Jerusalem church and, and these things happening that seem, well, where does it fit in? Acts 12 is a pivotal chapter in the book of Acts because after Acts 12, Peter, who has been at the forefront, right? Peter has sort of been the, the star. Under, understand what I'm saying. He fades to the background, and we only see him one more time, Acts chapter 15. He sort of disappears. After Acts 12, the Jerusalem church also fades to the background. And so here we have in Acts chapter 12, one of the last times you're really going to see Peter, and one of the last times we're really going to see the Jerusalem church. And it's in unusual circumstances, and it's in very, very difficult circumstances. So up in Antioch, 300 plus miles away, all sorts of things, great things are happening, but down south in Jerusalem in the mother church, dramatic and tragic events are unfolding in the church. Who's the king? Herod Agrippa. We've heard that name before, haven't we? We've all heard the name Herod before. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. Who was Herod the Great? Herod the Great was the one who tried to find and kill baby Jesus. Okay, what a terrible family legacy. So that was the grandfather. He is uh, the nephew of Herod Antipas. Who's Herod Antipas? Herod Antipas is the one who beheaded John the Baptist and had a part in the trial of Jesus. Herod Agrippa was uh, a smart and wicked king. He was one quarter Jewish and he killed his own father. Um, in consolidating power. And so he's on, and one day, his son, Agrippa II, will be the one who Paul stands before on, on trial sometime later. What a terrible family legacy when we don't follow the Lord. But brothers and sisters, God changes your destiny. God changes your, our DNA. God changes everything when we come to him. If you have been part of a family legacy or family DNA, if you will, that does not bring great pride to you when you think about it, let me tell you something about the word of God. The word of God says about you, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Amen. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so here we see Herod, and let's see what happens. What does he do? And this part I've called fighting against God, because that's what Herod does. He fights against God. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of verses, um, but we're not going to read them all. It's all in chapter 12, and then I'm going to give you some other verses. But here is Herod. He cruelly attacked some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, John's brother, with the, with the sword. Now, there are several Jameses in the New Testament, aren't there? Which James is this one? It tells us. Which one? Okay, the brother of John. So think back to the Gospels. James and John, the sons of... Thunder, okay? So both of them were disciples, now apostles. They're in the church. We don't really hear anything about John, but James is arrested by Herod, and it says he killed James with the sword. In the New Testament, especially in Acts, when you read killed with the sword, what that almost always means is beheaded, okay? That's just the terminology that would be used. Has James done anything particular? No. Not at all. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't broken the law. He hasn't done this. He hasn't done that. But Herod, for political gain, arrests James. He persecutes, persecutes the church, and he grabs a leader. Um, I always, uh, I, I remember when I was teaching in China, my students always used to, uh, they always used to, to tell me all sorts of Chinese proverbs and Chinese sayings. 
and they would say, and they were always very clever and, and almost always like four characters. Those of you who are Chinese know, know this very well. And one of the expressions was, kill a chicken to scare the monkeys. <laughs> have you ever heard that expression before? Right, some of us have or whatever. Well, imagine. Uh, and some of you are saying, what? Well, you're not Chinese, so you know, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it may not make so much sense to you. Um, but I understood it very, very well. And so what, what, better way to, what better way to thwart the church, to scare the church, than to take one of their leaders and kill him arbitrarily and suddenly? And so that's what he does. Why does he do it? He does it to gain the approval of the Jews. Um, are you ever surprised by wickedness? Me too. Sometimes, yes, right? You think, how can somebody be that way? How can somebody be that wicked? Herod is just that wicked, and the Jews, those that are not part, that have not followed Jesus, really are that wicked. Um, because it says that when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he arrested Peter too. Imagine being pleased by the beheading of an innocent person. And imagine being the one to order the beheading of an innocent person, but it brought pleasure to them. The depths of wickedness have no end. The heights of grace and love have no limit in God. And so we see this, and we see, as we said, this is James, the brother of John. And I want you to think, uh, remember that there will be another James, the half-brother of Jesus, right? And he's the one that is the author of the book of James later. So it's not that one. It is James, the brother of John, one of, think of for a minute what you know about him. He's the brother of John. He's one of the original 12. Would you say, to use natural terminology, would you say that he was one of the favorites of Jesus in a way? Yes, I think so. He was part of the inner circle, right? Remember when Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration, who did he take with him? Who? Peter, James, and John. When he did other things and he called them away, he called them apart to pray, who did he take? Peter, James, and John. And so we see this. Herod kills him. Now, why am I focusing on this? Why am I, why am I bearing down on this? This is a familiar story to us, and it seems like there's not a lot of doctrine in here, and it seems like there's not a lot of inspiration. But brothers and sisters, I believe there are things in this story that can encourage us this morning and help, to help us to answer and to understand our why questions sometimes. Because sometimes when we look at things that happen, we think, well, God, why? What are you doing? And I want you to see something this morning. James is the first of the 12 to die, to be martyred. We're not counting Judas. He, he committed suicide. That's a whole other issue. Stephen has been martyred. But of the original 12, James is the first. His brother, John, is the last. And he dies a natural death, as far as we know, of old age, though he was persecuted in his life. So here are two brothers, both of them favorites of the Lord. James killed first, John the very last. You and I sometimes look at things and we sometimes think, think that we look at other people and we sometimes think God has favorites. Have you ever thought that? Come on, be honest. God has favorites. May I say something to you this morning? I think that, and, and people may have closer relationships with God than others, some, because that's something that we choose to do as we walk closely with the Lord. But I want you to see something here this morning. If you feel that others are more loved or more favored of God than you are, I believe that this story tells us otherwise. God does not play favorites. He loved James and John equally. But James is martyred first, and John is the last, and he dies a natural death. I think this story shows us way back when God doesn't play favorites, then or now. You see, if we think that, 
then we start to feel God is a kind of unfair, don't we? A lot of us are part of families where our parents did not treat us fairly. Yes? Yes. yes. Maybe a brother or a sister was favored over you. And we bring that into our relationship with God and, other, and others in the family of God. And we begin to see, oh, well, see, good things happen to that person. Well, God likes that person better than he likes me. And then we start to almost have a grudge or a feeling against God. Well, God, what about me? Our God is not like that. Our Father is not like that. Brothers and sisters, he plays no favorites. His love is equal for you as it is for me. Don't think, oh, well, because we're pastors, God loves Pastor Nay and me better than he loves you. He does not. He does not. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And I think that's one of the things we see in this story. I really do. I really do. I think that's one of the reasons it's included. I think sometimes we look at what happens and we think, God, that's not fair. Brothers and sisters, if we're in the family of God, we will receive unfair treatment, every one of us, at some time or another. I can imagine some of them looked, wow, well, look what, hap look what happened to James. Because just shortly after here, Peter is going to escape prison. Miraculously. Still the same God. But all three of them, James, or James and Peter, both part of the inner circle. One is, is, has his head cut off. And the other one has an angel visitation in the middle of the night. God still is God. He's a God of love. And he is a God that will do right. The Bible is so clear. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. But our God is sovereign. And he knows what we don't know. And he sees what we don't see. And you and I look at others and we look at ourselves and we only see one aspect. We only see one thing. We only see one part. And we make a quick judgment, don't we? Well, God, this is not fair. Well, look, this happened. But our God, who is just and fair and loving, sees all parts and sees all sides. And he will do what is right in our lives. And so James is beheaded. Peter is arrested and he is thrown into prison as well. He is arrested sometime during the days of unleavened bread. That was the Passover, and then the following days of unleavened bread. It was all sort of called the Passover together, seven days. So Peter is arrested, he's in prison. How long? We don't know. It can't be more than seven days, but it's sometime in that, so it's about seven days or a few days less, and Peter's in prison, and it's very clear. This says, uh, went intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. May I give you a little footnote to verse 4? Actually, what that means is it's not that there's going to be a fair trial and Peter may be guilty or not guilty. He's going to bring him out, he's going to be judged, and Peter's going to be beheaded. This is what this means, okay? And it's not just going to be, you know, here in Hong Kong, we've been seeing some incredib incredibly dramatic trials and things in the news recently it things that happened five years ago and the trial is now that's not uh, three years ago when the trial is now not in the roman jewish world of that time they were brought out they were judged they were executed immediately so this is what was going to happen to peter what i want to say to you is this look at this with me peter is in prison he has four squads of four soldiers each to guard him uh, why do you think herod had four squads of four soldiers to guard Peter, uh, chained on either side and then at the doors and others as well. Why do you think that was? Because Peter had escaped before, hadn't he? Remember before in chapter 5, there had been a miraculous escape one time before. I think that was remembered, don't you? And Peter was the one who escaped. And when they went to get him out of the prison, where was Peter? He was standing in the temple preaching the gospel that time. I think Herod is determined that's not going to happen as they say, not on my watch, you know, as they say sometime. And so Peter, look with me, Peter is in an impossible situation that he cannot change. Now for some of you this morning, lights and bells should be blinking and dinging right now. 
because some of you this morning are in impossible situations. You are in situations where you feel where you are imprisoned. You are in situations and circumstances that you cannot change. You cannot change. You'd like to change them, but you can't. You've tried to change, but you can't. You don't have the power to change them. You don't even have the influence to change them. Does that make sense to you this morning? Because that describes Peter's situation as well. He had no influence. He had no earthly influence to change his situation. Herod was not going to let him go. No Jewish Christians could go before Herod and say, please, please, would you let Peter go? He's a good guy. He's our leader. That would have inflamed him even more. Peter was in a situation beyond his control, as are some of you this morning. And you may feel imprisoned. And I don't know how long you feel you've been imprisoned, but there you are, and there's no way out just like Peter. I'm not saying this is an analogy. I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying, see, this, is, this means this, but there's a lesson here for us this morning. I want to encourage you. Situations that look humanly impossible are heavenly possible. Amen? Amen. Humanly impossible, but heavenly possible. We try to figure out how God could do it. Have you ever tried to figure out how to get out of your impossible situation? I have. Well, I can do this. Well, I can try this, or and I can try that. And as I was thinking about it, the Lord kind of helped me think about, you, some of you, do you remember that movie from way back when uh, Steve McQueen was in it, James Garner and others, and it was called The Great Escape. It's like a three-hour movie from way, way, way back when. And it's all the ingenious ways they figure out to break to, to jailbreak from this German uh, from this German prison it's British and American and other so soldiers as well and they'd all these different ways to, to get out you and I are kind of like that as well but I want you to look at this situation in just a minute and uh, let's see I'm not going to read it but you've got it in your you, we know this story right so I'm just going to put it up here while we talk and I want you to think about it for I want you to think about it for just a minute as we look at this story because you and I in our impossible situations, we try to figure out, this is how I'm going to do it, right? And I want you to look at this. If you and I were in that situation and we were going to get Peter out of prison, even miraculously, think with me of how we would plan the great escape for Peter. I think it would go something like this. Well, it's God, so he can use an angel because God uses angels, right? He can use an angel, but the angel's going to have to be really quiet because there are four soldiers right there. And it's the middle of the night, so the angel can go, but he should not use his heavenly flashlight. He needs to do it in the dark, right? We think, or sorry, for those of you that say torch instead, his <laughs> heavenly torch, okay? So don't use the heavenly torch. And maybe he can use hand signals to get Peter to do what he wants to do. Now. Some of you are looking at me this morning saying, Pastor Jennifer, are you making fun of the Bible? No, I'm not making fun of the Bible. I'm making fun of us because that's how we are sometime. And I have a very serious purpose in, in talking about it in this way. Imagine, so the angel comes in, but he doesn't do it our way because God's God and God's not us. And what does he do? An angel of the Lord appeared, a light shown in the cell. If you read some other translations, it actually says a bright light for crying out loud. <laughs> a little candle. And instead of tapping Peter, what does he do? I don't know if it was that loud. He hits him on the side. He doesn't just tap his shoulder. And instead of using motions, what does he do? Peter, get up. <laughs> And so he goes through this whole thing. Peter gets up. Not only that, what happens to the chains? Clunk, clank, clank, clank. They fall off. Not only that, then the doors open. This is God, brothers and sisters. A few chapters earlier, the Lord himself transported Philip, the evangelist, from somewhere on the road about 25 miles away, right? He was there, and then boom, suddenly he was there. Couldn't God have done that for Peter and suddenly gotten him outside of the prison? 
Surely he could have, but he did not do that. He chose ways and he chose a method that Peter would never have dreamed of and that you and I wouldn't have dreamed of either. I think the point is this. God can get us out of impossible situations. He can get us out of difficult situations, but a lot of times it's not going to be the way we have dreamed it up. It's not going to be the way that we have planned. It's not going to be the way that we would orchestrate and try to maneuver. It's going to be God's way. It's miraculous. It's a miracle, and he does it. Nobody else can do it. You cannot do it, and I cannot do it, but God can do it. The point is that God works on your behalf in ways beyond what you can figure out. And I want to say one other thing about this. Uh, sorry, let me, let me, no, let me, let me say this first. I want to give you some verses this morning just to encourage you. They're in your handout, and we, because of, for the sake of time, um, we're going to take just a little more time, but I want you to look at these verses to be encouraged this morning if you are in an impossible and a difficult situation from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. Second Chronicles 20.12, this is what Jehoshaphat says when there's a huge army com coming against him, and he says, Oh, our God, will not you judge them? For we are powerless against this vast multitude that comes to fight against us. And here's the sentence that I love, 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 and that I pray, 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 and so should you. We do not know what to do, but we look to you. Another translation says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Let me ask you something this morning if you're in an impossible situation. Are your eyes on the soldiers? Are your eyes on the chains? Are your eyes on the bars? Are your eyes on the prison? Or are your eyes on the Lord who knows what to do? That's where our eyes need to be. If our eyes are anywhere else, beloved, we're going to get discouraged and fearful. And, and, yeah, what else? Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. I love this one as well, New Testament, right? He's able to do far more abundantly. We say, oh God, help me, whatever. And God says, I can do much more than that. I can do much, much more than that. Look at Jeremiah 33, 3, back to the Old Testament. This is a great one, too. Call to me, says the Lord, and I will answer you and show you or tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. What impossible prison are you in this morning? Call to him, and God will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Not in yourself, but in him. Here's another one that's great. I love this one because this is about Herod fighting against God who gets eaten by worms at the end, by the way. And we're not going to get there that far this morning, but he gets eaten by worms. Psalms 2, 2 through 4, just two of the verses. The rulers plot together against the Lord. That's what Herod was doing, wasn't he? He was plotting against the church. He was plotting against Peter. But there was someone greater than Herod. Herod thought he had all power. He thought he had all control. But verse 4 tells us, But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. I want to encourage you this morning. I'm sorry if you're offended. My voice is a little bit loud this morning. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to hear me through the prison bars. If you're in a prison this morning, the Lord laughs at those bars. He laughs at those that are fighting against you. He laughs at the things that imprison you. Not that he doesn't care. He does care. But the Lord sees from his perspective, not from your perspective. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, of everything. And that's why we've got to look to him. I love these verses. Let it encourage you. And if you are discouraged this morning or in bondage or in prison, I urge you, come to these verses, memorize them, meditate upon them. Let them get deep in your heart. What was Peter doing that night when the angel came? What was he doing? We read, didn't we? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. The church was praying. We know that, right? The church was praying. He was sleeping. Was Peter a lazy Christian? Well, the church will pray, so I'm going to sleep. I, uh, sometimes we're like that, aren't we? Let somebody else pray, and we don't. I don't believe that at all. Not at all. Peter 
had reached a place of peace. Yesterday afternoon, as I'd finished the preparation, I was just waiting on the Lord and praying, and I felt like the Holy Spirit especially quickened this point to me, and we close with this this morning. I really appreciate your attention as we come to this point this morning. Peter was sleeping in the imprisoning circumstances in the prison cell that night. He had reached a place of peace, though his circumstances were unchanged as yet. And so he could sleep. Did he see the answer? No. Were the doors open? No. Were the chains off? No. But he had reached the place of peace and he could sleep. You see, brothers and sisters, God loves you. And he's not going to let you drown. And he's not going to let you sink. And he's not going to let you burn. And he's not going to let you fail. He's going to save you. But the devil who hates you, even when God is going to rescue you, will hound you and harry you and harass you. And you and I will live in anxiety and fear, even when God is going to do something. But the devil, oh, 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 oh. You know what I mean, don't you? I, I remember one time I, had pr I was going through something. It was so difficult. I had prayed. I had fasted. And I was so filled with anxiety that I was sick to my stomach, literally sick to my stomach. I just wanted to throw up all the time. I, it, it was so awful. I had not reached the place of peace. And the devil was just harassing me and hounding me. Because that's the kind of devil he is. That's his personality. That's what he does. That's how he operates in our lives. But our God who loves us and who will rescue us from impossible circumstances, wants us to get to the place of peace. And then when you get to the place of peace, you sleep. You rest. You, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6, you stand. In fact, it says you stand your ground. You're not out there fighting the enemy, but you're in the place of victory. You stand your ground. That's what Ephesians 6 says, means, and we don't have time to go into that to this, mor this morning, but it fits with this situation here. That means you've, you're in the place that you're supposed to be, and, it is, and what you do then is you just defend your position. Will the enemy give up? No. The enemy really doesn't give up. He keeps on whoa, whoa, coming after us, but what do you do, and what do I do? We've reached the place of peace, and we stand. And when we've reached the place of peace, when we've reached the ground we're supposed to be on, we're on solid ground. We're on firm ground. We can stand. We take all the weapons of our warfare that are mighty, that come from God. I don't have weapons strong enough to fight the devil, nor do you. Peter had no key to that prison door, none whatsoever. He had no influence with Herod, but God, he had God. And that's who you, ha you have, and that's who I have. And you come to the place, you take the weapons that God gives you, you feed your faith with the word of God. Has your faith been wavering? Get into the word of God. Feed your faith with the word of God. Have you been feeling isolated? Get back in church and get with other Christians. Stand, let them stand together with you. Have you been drifting in prayer and you feel like whatever? Get back in prayer, whether you feel like it or not. Feed your faith. Spend time with the Lord. Receive His weapons. Receive His protection that He has for you. So you will stand and you'll still be in your prison cell because the answer may not have come yet. The answer may not have been revealed yet in your life. But you, you and I, We'll sleep, we'll rest, and the enemy cannot harass you and hound you. And he may, oh, you stand your ground. You say, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. I think that's why Peter was able to sleep. 
I think Peter knew the word, my God shall supply. Well, that's New Testament. So Peter didn't know all that, didn't know that yet. Peter had the Old Testament. Peter had the Old Testament. And he knew that his God was his shield and his reward. And that he that dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my rock, my fortress, in whom I trust. Brothers and sisters, there's a place of peace, there's a place of rest, and it may still be in the prison. But it's a place of safety. Peter was just as secure and just as at peace there because his eyes were on God. When you fight against God, you lose. Herod gets eaten by worms. Peter gets released from prison. We're going to pray this morning. And if you're in prison this morning and you are in circumstances and situations beyond your control, beyond your influence, bring them to the Lord right now. I thank you for your patience. I know I went over. Lord, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for your word, Acts chapter 12, that maybe a lot of us have sort of ignored up to now and thought, well, that's an interesting story, but not a lot there. But Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh God, that our brother Peter could sleep in the prison when the next day Herod intended to put him to death. And Lord, some of us feel that same way, that doom and disaster is right ahead. But O oh God, I, this morning we pray, Lord, and I pray for the church this morning. O oh God, may your people May your people set their eyes upon you. May they call out to you. May you tell them great and mighty things that they do not know, that they have not yet seen. Oh God, as they look to you and call on you, will you do more than they can ask or they can imagine because you are their God and you have an answer for them and your love is great and mighty and powerful. Oh Father, bring us to the place of peace and may we stand our ground when the enemy attempts to harass us and hound us and chase us and cause us to fear and dismay and doubt, may we stand our ground with every weapon you have given us, with the family of God, with the word of God, with the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen and amen, amen.